Greetings, and thank you for joining us today. I hope you and your family are doing well during these uncertain times. I am Vanessa Lathan, pronouns she, her, hers, a member of the Greater Baltimore HIV Health Services Planning Council. We invite you on a journey to remember the importance of talking with community and not at community. Our workshop today is entitled Utilizing a Social Science Framework to Guide Development and Implementation of a Status Neutral Needs Assessment. Our team, who will each introduce themselves, are the change agents behind the success of the Needs Assessment Survey for the Baltimore Metropolitan, Eligible Metropolitan Area. From epidemiologists, nurses, program managers and directors to center chiefs, our team is knowledgeable public health leaders. But beyond the degrees, our team represents members of the vulnerable population we all are trying to reach every day. Youth, Black, Latinx, and same gender loving individuals. Our team has no relevant financial or non-financial interest to disclose. Please know our five learning objectives for our time together today. As you read over the learning objectives, I would like to bring attention to the following words, stakeholders, community, and transparency. In a time of continued displays of systemic racism, trying to survive in pandemic, and mourning the lives of our heroes who we lost this year, elevating the voice of the communities disproportionately infected and affected by HIV, other sexually transmitted diseases, and by the social determinants of health is more important than ever. I invite you to have an open mind, to challenge your own personal biases, and to use this workshop as a tool to address the underlying needs of the vulnerable populations your organization serves. Again, thank you so much for joining us today, and I do hope that you enjoy. Please meet our first survey workgroup member, C. Thank you, Vanessa. And my name is Sidla Fenyenta, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. And I wanted to take this opportunity to thank everyone for um, being a part of this workshop. It's important for us as a group to let you know that a lot of time in the formative stage of the survey development has been spent on what our philosophy is as a group. So we will just go through the six basic pillars of the philosophy of the work group um, for you today. First is HIV status neutrality. We wanted to make sure that we were assessing the needs of Marylanders that cover the HIV care continuum. We were also very, very committed to ensuring equity and looking at our questions of lived experiences by key populations and having those questions implemented by interviewers who share a common voice for the diverse communities. Three, we were really grounded on cultural humility. The members of the work group I'm proud um, to serve with were grounded in the philosophy of cultural humility. That means being aware of our personal cultural biases, being sensitive to significant cultural issues faced by others, and awareness of one's privilege. In the next slide is the, third, the fourth um, philosophy, collaboration. We thought that it was important for us to really diversify the body of stakeholders to best inform the content, implementation, and results of the needs assessment. We also wanted to make sure that there was active participation. 
in an eligible metropolitan area that had seven jurisdictions. We wanted to really ensure that all of the voices um, were available and were able to offer their expertise of experience. Finally, we wanted collective ownership. Disseminating the governance and the decision making to the entire group, so not one voice is more important than the other. Now, in the next slide, um, we will go back to the history of the Planning Council. In essence, the Baltimore-Columbia Towson metropolitan area was one of the first EMAs funded early in the history of the Ryan White program when it was passed in 1990. 2021 will mark 30 years um, for this planning council as a regional planning body as defined under the Ryan White Act. As all of you know, planning councils are mandated by legislation to really look at the documented needs of people living with HIV. Paramount to our planning process is an understanding of the ability to conduct a consumer needs assessment survey and to make it so that it spans the entire continuum. And with this, I would like to um, give the mic back to my colleague, Vanessa Lathan. Thanks, Eve. I am back to discuss knowing your why. Knowing and acting intentionally on your why is essential. The purpose of the needs assessment survey was and is to create a safe space for broad-based community engagement for persons undiagnosed, vulnerable to HIV, or zero positive. The needs assessment is the foundation of Ryan White planning process. The community voice of the Baltimore EMA includes Baltimore six Baltimore City and the six surrounding jurisdictions. Because the six surrounding jurisdictions or seven including Baltimore City represent rural, rural, suburban, and urban geographical areas, our team intentionally conducted outreach to all seven areas. In order to improve the lives, in order to improve the health of those in the state or US territory your organization is in and to inform HRSA CDC funded programming, including the end of the HIV epidemic plan, community engagement must occur at every phase of the process. The results of our survey will help to inform programmatic and fiscal operations such as policy, funding allocations, social media marketing, and expanded engagement with people of lived experience. Now, please join me in welcoming our next team member, Fernando. Hello, thank you, Vanessa. My name is Fernando Menacarasco, and my gender pronouns are he, his, and him. As my colleague Vanessa Lathan just mentioned, uh, the needs assessment is truly an initiative that is grounded in the same broad-based community engagement that has been a tenant of the Ryan White planning process for decades. So with that in mind, what we are emphasizing throughout this whole presentation is that we intentionally and assertively built a diverse coalition with representation from six out of the seven Maryland jurisdictions included in the Baltimore EMA starting in September of 2019. This meant traveling to each county to physically recruit participants and to engage stakeholders at, at the very start of the process. Also meant um, making all meetings available via Google Meet or a remote platform to provide access to any representatives uh, who were perhaps in a rural county uh, and the outer skirts of the EMA, even before it became a necessity with the pandemic. Um, and in terms of governing an administrative structure for this project, the survey process itself is managed by the Comprehensive Planning Committee, which is the standing committee of the Planning Council for the Baltimore EMA. And both Vanessa, Lathan, and I co-chair this committee. 
But in order to better match skill to task to passion, we divided the group of stakeholders into two primary groups um, that reported their outcomes to the Comprehensive Planning Committee. First, it was the survey design work group, and second, a survey implementation work group. Well, survey design focuses on uh, developing the ground theory as well as the tool for assessing. Uh, and the survey implementation is uh, about the community partnerships and the linkages to roll out um, this uh, survey based on the, the planned um, structure. Both of these groups uh, were supported by the Planning Council Support Office, as well as Barrett LaRussa, who is a stellar postgraduate public health fellow working on this project. Um, and both of these uh, groups uh, were led by individuals who co-facilitated their own processes and timelines to achieve the overarching project deliverables. And ne next slide, please. Um, and to go into more detail about these groups that I described uh, generally in the previous slide, um, here we first have the survey design group, uh, which is a, uh, a group that is led by two epidemiologists, both of whom brought in different skill sets around foundational applied theory, as well as quantitative and qualitative analysis. Uh, and the survey design is governed by key principles uh, that were touched on by Vanessa earlier, that include transparency, stakeholder engagement, and iteration. So in other words, through a repetitive process of information sharing and insight integration, uh, they achieve their outcomes. In addition to coordinating all of the stakeholder, uh, stakeholders in the design process, the survey design group also led a pre-testing of the tool to inform accurate implementation um, as we head into this implementation phase. And moving on to uh, the survey implementation group, um, this is a group that is led by a nursing student, a community health educator, and an epidemiologist, again, leveraging each other's skill sets ranging from communication to community contacts, to applied science, et cetera. The implementation group has a defined process that is strongly rooted in partnership and in the agency of local partners to dictate their involvement in their needs assessment. Uh, the implementation group also operationalizes the sampling methodology and the theory of the design created in partnership with the design group. And perhaps most importantly, uh, the implementation work group is governed by an intense drive to ensure an effective representation of the community voice and always ensuring that the interests of these communities may be the guiding principle and insight um, that informs these efforts. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nicole Richmond, who has co-led the design work group, along with Rachel Bikeda. Um, they will go into more detail about the design process itself. Well, thank you, Fernando. Um, my name is Nicole. Um, my gender pronouns are she, her, and hers. Um, so the survey design group was co-chaired um, by myself um, and uh, two members of the full work group. Um, and we were responsible for coordination between all sub work group members and then the synthesis of all contributions the sub work group members made. We sought to outline the process and timeline beforehand. Uh, this would allow us to gather feedback from our work group members and then proactively make changes to increase the participation as well as maintain transparency. We identified um, six phases with individual uh, sets of goals that um, our members agreed to adhere to. We did not sign uh, a number of meetings to each phase um, and that was to ensure flexibility. However, we did set deadlines for the completion of each phase so that we could meet the tight deadline of a January 1st um, submission to the Maryland Department of Health Institutional Review Board. Uh, the six phases are illustrated in a flow diagram. Uh, the six phases are as follows. So we mapped out the content using the framework. We identified available data and gaps in data. We then had a discussion and evaluating our progress. Uh, based on the missing content, we then created a wish list of survey questions or content. But we finally then developed the survey that was based on really just trimming down that wish list of items that, and we really um, 
followed a, an exclusion and um, exclusion criteria. Um, and then finally, we shared uh, the final survey with stakeholders. So let's talk about developing the framework and data mapping. So that was the first phase to ground the data collection with established health behavior models and the current HIV prevention uh, care delivery models, we created a matrix for a modified data mapping plan. And we used the social ecological model and the HIV care continuum. The social ecological model serves as the social determinants of health framework. The social ecological model outlines the content in which people live and how this shapes health related factors. At each level, there are risk and protective factors. So for example, at the society level, we may look at things like housing policy. At the community level, we evaluate the community to see the distribution of health supporting resources. At the social network level, which includes a person's family, friends, sexual partners, we look at things like social norms and groups. All the above layers then impact the individual. In the context of HIV prevention and care, we are concerned with knowledge, skills, attitudes, and behaviors associated with exposure to or transmission vulnerability. Next, we look at each level of the social ecological model across the HIV care continuum. So combining the two enabled us to create a modified data mapping matrix framework. So here's the layout of our matrix. It's a lot of information. As you see, we've added two stages to the HIV care continuum. That is to emphasize our status neutral approach to our needs assessment and the pivotal role that public health is grounded in prevention science. To provide further focus, we describe who would be quote, eligible for each HIV care continuum stage. Then for each population within each stage, we composed goals for prevention and care. Thus, Collectively knowing who to target and the goals for each stage, we were able to focus our brainstorming meetings to determine what type of data we wanted in our survey. So let's start with the first stage, and this is defined as the general population. This stage has two goals. One, to decrease the probability of engaging in behaviors that increase HIV exposure, and two, to promote community-based resources for the population to use to promote resiliency and engaging in behaviors that increase HIV exposure. So what's an example? Um, say we wanted to collect at the community level um, the number of community organizations supporting LGBTQ youth in positive youth development. And then maybe at the societal level, we can look at things like sex education curriculum for each school district. Moving across the continuum, the next population is defined as individuals who have a history of engagement behaviors that are associated with a high probability of exposure to HIV and the individual status of HIV is unknown. This stage has three goals as displayed here. So an example of data we wanted to gather are perhaps number of syringe service programs by jurisdiction, the prevalence of different STIs by zip code, and the medical field related stigma associated with sexuality, alcohol, and substance use. The next stage is defined to encompass individuals who have been tested and the result is non reactive. There are four goals associated with this stage. Examples of the data we wanted was knowledge of and access to PrEP, frequency of HIV testing, and then the beliefs about HIV testing. The next stage is defined to encompass individuals who know their HIV diagnosis status but are not engaged in care. There are four goals for this stage. Examples of the data we wanted for this stage include medical mistrust, knowledge about antiretrovirals, and HIV stigma. The second to last stage along the continuum is comprised of individuals who know their HIV diagnosis status and are engaged in care but have not yet reached or achieve viral suppression. There are five goals for this stage that helped us to determine the data we wanted across each level of the social ecological model. Examples of the data we wanted include HIV, care, self-efficacy, experiences of and coping with the side effects related to antiretrovirals, factors related to discontinuity of staying on retro antiretrovirals, 
and then knowledge of and application of HIV medical care indices, such as CD4 counts. The final stage of the HIV care continuum is composed of individuals who know their HIV diagnosis status and are engaged in care and have achieved viral suppression. The sole goal of this stage is to empower those individuals to continue engaging in their care to maintain viral suppression. Examples of data we wanted include policy programs that place an undue burden on clients rather than treating clients like partners, factors that might impede continuity of access to medication, such as housing security, job security, or substance and abuse mental health facility policy that whether or not they give HIV care and treatment. The next uh, component of the presentation is going to be um, taken over by my rock star team member, Rachel Vicara. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Um, hi, I'm Rachel Vicara. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am the co-chair of the survey design group. Um, once we had created the framework and completed it, we began a process of collecting existing information on which areas data had already been collected and which areas needed further inquiry. There are a number of ongoing HIV studies in the city of Baltimore, and we wanted to avoid duplicating data collection efforts and further fatiguing vulnerable populations with another lengthy survey. Um, even more, we wanted to collect information that would enrich not only the efforts of the Planning Council, but would be useful for programs and individuals living in the Baltimore EMA. So we evaluated the topics within the matrix by categorizing them in three ways. The first was if the data on that topic was available and sufficient. If that was the case, we developed a summary measures table um, that, we that we called the Community Indicator Index to describe and document um, that data. And that would then provide context for what we would collect with our needs assessment. The second category was the data was available, but it was insufficient. So if that was the case, we tried to find an appropriate proxy, da uh, proxy data set. For example, if the prevalence of neonatal abstinence syndrome and opioid related emergency department visits are increasing, this might be indicative of a systemic opioid problem and can inform which community-based organizations to reach out to um, in the event of discussing this issue if that's brought up in an implementation meeting. If there wasn't a proxy, it was prioritized for inclusion in our survey. The last way was the data was just not available. And if that was the case, that was also prioritized for inclusion in our survey. Um, next, please. So on our way of looking at this data, we continually were discussing and evaluating our progress. The co-chairs, so Nicole and I, were responsible for synthesizing and presenting the existing body of data from work group members to identify the gaps and redundancies together. There was, there is a pervasive feeling among the community that all this research is happening and nothing is coming from it. In this case, we wanted to make sure that for this project, that was not true. Um, the group was act asked to imagine how the needs assessment could contribute to not only existing research efforts, but more importantly, the existing programmatic efforts to address the HIV epidemic in the Baltimore EMA. So together, the group identified topic areas for the survey, which included basic demographic information, sexual behavior, housing security and financial stress, food security, access to health services, and trust of the healthcare and medical field, among many other things. Topic areas that were important but could not be feasibly included in the survey for whichever reason, we're moved to a separate parking lot document with the aim of discussing these areas in the future with the Planning Council. Once we had done that, um, all group members chose a topic area such as housing or mental health to research for the survey questions. Members were asked to find relevant survey questions with an emphasis on validated tools to submit to the co-chairs, which we then organized. Um, we saved each of these tools and sets of survey questions in separate folders for each topic area within a Google Drive that everybody could access. We then created a single document with all the contributions of the group members. This became our survey wish list. 
from this wish list, we met frequently to pare down the list and edit the content when it was appropriate. And a larger body of stakeholders was also engaged, specifically the local health departments at Carroll County, Baltimore County, Harford County, Howard County, and Anne Arundel County. We also worked with a bunch of community organizations. We requested for staff or others interested to join the work group to solicit feedback um, on the survey content or the survey questions, even if they hadn't been involved in the survey process before. We dedicated more than six meetings over the course of three weeks to build consensus around survey questions. We frequently referred to our framework and community indicators table to determine which topics and which survey tools to keep. We also evaluated the topics following five criteria. Um, well, <laughs> five criteria and then one more. The first was Dr. Cargill's hierarchy. So that was used to identify which content had the greatest weight and the greatest number of questions would correspond. And we wanted to ensure that the areas with the most questions were the ones that we needed the most information, not to waste the questions. From there, we used a lens of utility following four different applications. The first was programmatic activities. Um, is this information useful for programs? Is this information useful for policy? Was it useful for mass media campaigns like social marketing? Or was it useful for community-based organization partnerships? Initially, we also included quality control measures that were asked to the survey interviewers to understand their experiences during the survey. Unfortunately, this component of the survey was removed due to changes in implementation because of COVID-19. Next, we developed the sampling distribution of target groups. To determine the sample size for each jurisdiction, we reviewed descriptive statistics for each jurisdiction to inform proportional sampling. The aim of this evaluation was to determine which metric could inform equitable proportions across jurisdictions, perhaps weighted percentages or other adjustments for proportional sampling. Due to budgetary constraints, we could fund a maximum of 1,200 surveys. A simple solution was reached. For analysis, we needed a baseline of at least 100 individuals from each jurisdiction. The simple solution uh, aligned with our philosophy in the design process, equity. However, we needed to account for the disparate rates and estimated HIV for the most recent year, both diagnosed and undiagnosed. And so this base number was supplemented with the respective jurisdiction rate. Um, and in this chart, you can see the row entitled um, estimate undiagnosed HIV rate. Um, furthermore, because Baltimore City exhibits the greatest density and burden of HIV prevalence, an additional 100 individuals were added to this jurisdiction sample size. After these allocations were made, the remaining excess sample counts were evenly distributed across the six jurisdictions. Once the final count for each jurisdiction was summed, we looked to the literature to identify the distri distribution of the population that reported identifying each target group. We made three assumptions. One, for each group's estimated proportion, we assume the proportion of the population that identified with each group to be evenly distributed across jurisdictions. For example, the same proportion of young black, gay, and bisexual men in Carroll County is the same as the proportion in Baltimore County. Two, each group is unique and where appropriate, the joint probability is used to estimate unique group proportions. Three, similar sampling errors for estimation are applied to each estimate. Another, temp, another target sample size we needed um, to be in accordance with Ryan White, Part A, we needed to sample 400 respondents who identified as people living with HIV or AIDS. How do we do this in keeping with the philosophy of status neutrality and public health research ethics, respect for persons? The survey design team elected to use eligibility for PrEP as a proxy for serial conversion. The solution provided the flexibility to meet the RHAP Part A sampling goals while ensuring fidelity to the process of auton <laughs> autonomy and respect for the survey respondents was held. The survey design co-chairs evaluated the survey to determine which key variables existed in the survey um, instrument and um, that could be used then to calculate PrEP eligibility. To track that target sample sizes are reached, the survey design co-chairs are also responsible for the daily download of the survey data once the implementation has begun um, and running SAS code to calculate the respective sample counts by jurisdiction. A protocol is in place to provide the updated counts to the interview team leader 
This timely update informs the interview team leader about outreach efforts and whether to target new venues or increase outreach times or number of interviews in an already reached venue. Once the survey tool and the tablet were completed, we shared the complete version with the survey design work group for any last minute small changes. We then created a summary document to simply and easily present the content of the survey to our partners. Finally, we presented the survey summary to the Planning Council for final executive approval, thereby officially closing the survey design process and initiating the next stage of submission to the IRB. Once the Planning Council approved the survey, the survey design workgroup members and partners were informed that changes could no longer be made to the survey tool. After that, we then moved to pre-testing. So with the approval of the Pound, um, <laughs> we began pre-testing. It was conducted in two stages. The first was internal testing by workgroup members and the Maryland Department of Health employees on the production sur survey to calculate the average time to take the survey, the flow of the domains, and functionality of skip logic. The second phase was external testing among planning council members and allies in Philadelphia and Washington DC EMAs. Um, the test survey included questions that asked the respondents about the survey and their experiences taking the survey. On this slide, we're sharing the test survey questions that we asked the pretest respondents to take upon completing the survey. We were able to capture the average time of completing the survey, look at the patterns of skips that we expected, and get feedback on the survey. Overall, respondents took about 20 to 30 minutes to complete the survey. We identified some skip and flow challenges that we could fix and received some feedback that supported the need to add questions concerning COVID-19. Very few respondents said that they would recommend the survey, however. Um, in hindsight, this may not have necessarily been a useful question because who would they have recommended the survey to and for what purpose? But one of the many things that we've learned in this process. And so now I'm going to hand it off to Kimon Jones for survey implementation. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Kimon Jones, and I am one of the leads for the survey implementation work group. Um, so welcome to the survey implementation section of the Baltimore EMA Needs Assessment survey presentation. In this section, we will discuss the implementation's work group's aim to reach groups most impacted by HIV in the Baltimore EMA as determined based on currently available epidemiological data and the methods we use to achieve this aim. We will go over topics such as establishing partnerships, recruitment of survey sites and participants, hiring of interviewer staff, and, and selection and disbursement of gift card incentives. We will also discuss the modifications we made to our plans in response to COVID-19 to protect the health and safety of both survey participants and staff. The implementation group is a collaborative group of community members, staff, and volunteers from partner organizations and health departments, faculty at public health universities, and more. The group is co-chaired by two members of the Planning Council. First, we would like to provide you with some background or context for how this survey was implemented in the past years. In the past, most survey participants took the survey in Baltimore City because many people living with HIV or AIDS who lived in the EMA counties surrounding Baltimore City seek care and treatment in the city. We saw this as an opportunity for growth and inclusion and partner with the EMA county local health departments to plan for more active participants recruitment from their counties. At least 100 participants will be recruited from each county involved in the project. Local health departments were also invited to have an active role in planning all aspects of survey design and implementation. After the survey project is conducted, each local health department will have access to its county specific survey data to perform additional analysis to support their own programming needs. As mentioned before, the overarching goal of the implementation group is to create and implement protocols that ensure the survey is accessible to those most impacted by HIV in the Baltimore EMA. These groups are intersectional and they include youth, gay and bisexual men, especially who identify as black and or Latino, persons with substance use disorder and transgender women of color. 
these groups are not exclusionary. Another 13% of survey participants may identify with groups not, speci not specifically named here, but who also bear a disproportionate burden of HIV in our area, such as the elderly and individuals who are foreign born. We adopted a venue-based sampling approach to engage these populations. Through, meeting with, through meetings with partner organizations and local health departments, we mapped out venues in Baltimore City and the surrounding counties where potential participants spend their time and identified times of the day best suited for engaging participants at these venues. A spreadsheet or scheduling planner was developed to schedule surveying shifts at each venue for each date across the 11 week implementation period. This spreadsheet will also document the number of surveys that were completed at each sampling event or survey shifts. Venues include community-based organizations, health clinics, community events, public spaces such as parks, and bars and entertainment venues. Prior to survey launch, the COVID-19 pandemic necessitated the decision to modify survey implementation into a remote format to help slow the spread of COVID-19 and protect the health and safety of participants and survey staff. You will notice the split format of this slide. We have displayed our initial implementation plan and the modified plan we developed in response to COVID-19. And our modified protocols, we attempted to remain as true as possible to our original venue-based sampling approach, even with surveying being done remotely. In practice, this means that partner organizations who were originally going to serve as sampling venues will now have a more active role in survey marketing and participant recruitment, especially from among their clients. On a daily basis, the survey epidemic epidemiologists will produce reports of participant demographics and county of residence to ensure that the target sample sizes are being met and to guide ongoing survey administration and recruitment decisions, such as scheduling of survey shifts and recruitment of new venues, if needed. With remote survey implementation, more surveys will be unscheduled than originally planned. So this tracking method will be even more important for ensuring that the survey is reaching Current, currently out of care and at rest groups impacted by HIV. We will now discuss in greater detail the important role that partner organizations and other stakeholders have in this survey project. First, they have helped guide all aspects of survey design and the development of implementation protocols. Second, they have had an important role in spreading the word about the survey project throughout their networks, allowing other organizations to learn about the project, take part in survey planning meetings, and serve as venues. When we're hiring survey staff, these organizations help advertise the job opening throughout their networks, including to their clients and volunteers. Third, partner organizations will play an important role in advertising the survey opportunity to their clients. Many organizations originally would have served as survey sites, but now they will have a more active role in recruiting participants and, in some cases, scheduling participants. Many more organizations than are listed here have had key roles in planning of survey implementation. They also contributed value insights that guided the development of new hire training for the survey administration staff. We also had conversation staff, conversations with staff from local health departments, clinics, prep programs, and harm reduction teams to learn more about groups most impacted by HIV and their counties and to learn about organizations that might be interested in serving as venues. Local health departments also committed to advertising the survey opportunity to their clients and to providing faculty space facility space for survey administration. Recruitment of partner organizations and venues is a, is a continuing process. Additionally, organizations can join survey work group meetings at any time, and new venues will be recruited throughout the survey implementation period as needed. Next, we will discuss our strategies for marketing the survey to potential participants. We aim to make the survey opportunities available to everyone, especially those who are not yet engaged in care or other services. Digital advertisement, 
such as social media, dating applications, and electronic newsletters was part of our original marketing approach. But we will have an even greater role now that the survey administration will be done remotely. As not all participants will have regular access to internet, flyers will be posted primarily at essential businesses and partner organizations that are providing essential health and other services. We will also advertise the survey opportunity at any community events that have transitioned to an online format and will provide information on how to call in to take your survey. The daily reporting that is performed by the survey epidemiologists will help inform survey marketing efforts. For example, if recruitment is low in a certain county or among a certain group, we will increase advertising, advertising efforts in that area or among that group to improve survey recruitment. Now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Chris, who will continue discussing survey implementation. Hello, my name is Christopher Stuckey, and I worked with Kiman as co-chair into the implementation work group. We will now discuss logistics of survey implementation. When possible, participants will be scheduled in advance to take the survey. However, to help make the survey accessible, participants will also be able to call in and take the survey at that time, similar to walk-in surveys that would have occurred with in-person surveying. Participants who want to schedule in advance will call in to speak with the survey staff and schedule a date and time for taking the survey with a trained interviewer. Any information collected for scheduling purposes will be kept separate from survey data at all times. Partner organizations will also help with scheduling. They can directly schedule any clients who are interested in the survey, and they will give them information on how to call in and speak with an interviewer who will guide them through the survey at their scheduled time. And now for survey administration, participant recruitment. And now for survey administration, participant recruitment by partner organizations such as community based organizations and local health departments will look much the same. For example, staff may mention the survey opportunity during ongoing telehealth appointments or any other essential appointments. Moving the survey to a remote format may increase accessibility to the survey for some, such as those with limited time or those for whom transportation would have been a barrier. However, a limitation is that participants must have access to a phone or to internet to complete the survey. Surveys were originally to take place in private spaces throughout the EMA. With remote survey administration, participants will be able to take the survey wherever they are, with interviewers encouraging them to find a private space for completing the survey. In our original administration plans, participants would have completed the survey on a tablet with the interviewer available to answer any questions or to read the survey aloud and record responses if more active assistance was needed. This participant-led approach was meant to allow for more privacy for the participant while moving through the survey. Our aim is to maintain this participant-led strategy as much as possible with remote administration. Participants who are comfortable with completing an electronic survey will be sent a link to the survey for them to complete themselves with the interviewer available as needed. If more assistance is needed, or if the participant does not have internet, the interviewer will read the survey to the participant and record their responses. Lastly, we had originally planned to provide transportation to survey sites and provide food. Delivering food to participants with remote survey administration has proved to be a challenge, but is something we would like to be able to do in the future if remote survey administration is done.
ensuring privacy and confidentiality during all survey activities is especially important with remote survey administration. Prior to starting the survey, the participant will read or be read an introductory script, which familiarizes the participant with the purpose of taking the survey and a consent script, which gives them information on participating in research and on their rights as a research volunteer. For remote survey administration, the wording of these two scripts was simplified to be more readable for the participant. All required components of consent are still present. After reading or being read this information, the participant answers yes or no to the consent question. With the response of yes, the survey can begin. During their training, interviewer staff will be trained in research ethics and how to protect participant confidentiality, especially with remote surveying. Interviewers will be working from home in private spaces and will encourage participants to find a private space to protect their privacy during any verbal discussions that might take place about survey questions and responses. At the conclusion of the survey, each participant will be given a list of resources available to them in their county. These resources include HIV and STI testing locations, resources for accessing shelter, housing, food, health insurance, and health care, and other services. Resource referral can be provided electronically at the conclusion of the survey or as a hard copy in the mail, depending on the participants' preferences. We have developed resource sheets specific to each county that will be reviewed by health departments and partner organizations in each county since they have the most up-to-date information on high-quality resources currently operating in their area. As compensation for their time in completing the needs assessment survey, participants will be given a $20 gift card. Participants have the option to choose from a range of grocery stores, pharmacies, and department store chains. We selected stores with locations across the EMA and chose stores that would be useful to participants. We sent a poll to partner organizations asking their input on which stores would be of value to their client and use this information to select the final range of gift card options. After the conclusion of the survey, the interviewer will provide the participant with information about how to receive their gift card. The participant is then linked to a designated staff member who will disperse the gift cards via mail, email, or curbside pickup in accordance with the participant's preferences. This designated staff member will also perform gift card tracking and auditing activities as required by the Baltimore City Health Department. The implementation work group was responsible for hiring a 15 member paid part-time survey team. We use the job title community outreach interviewer to reflect the emphasis of hiring from the communities we hope to engage in the survey and because of the important aspect of providing participants with information about available resources. Qualifications for the interviewer were broad based, including vast experiences such as life, volunteer, or work experience, regardless of educational degrees. We created a flyer advertising the job opportunity, distributed it to partner organizations through social media and to work group members who spread the opportunity throughout their networks. Over 120 persons applied to the position. The job application itself was a simple survey monkey 
that allowed participants to discuss any experiences they had related to sexual health, HIV prevention and care, serving vulnerable populations, or doing outreach. A resume was not required at the time of application. However, applicants could submit one if they wished. Applications were screened using a protocol that looked for two main features, comfort speaking with diverse groups and commitment to reaching as many participants as possible. Applicants that best demonstrated these qualities were contacted for a job interview. Interviews took place either in person or virtually. The interview panel include members of the survey work group and implementation work group. Each interviewee was asked the same set of questions, which sought to learn more about their interest in working with persons impacted by HIV and vulnerable populations. For consistency and objectivity, their responses were scored using a standardized rubric. Once job interviews were complete, and the candidates selected, the hiring process was handed over to the BCHD Human Resources Department. Over to you, Barrett. Thank you, Chris. My name is Barrett, my pronouns are she, hers, and I am a fellow who has been providing support for this project. And lastly, we are going to go over the remote interactive training that we have developed for this team of interviewer staff. The facilitators of the training will be survey work group members and staff from partner organizations and local health departments who have expertise in the topics that we'll be covering and training. The survey asks in-depth questions and asks participants to share information on sometimes sensitive topics. So training will, emph will emphasize how to engage with participants with cultural humility, empathy, and with a trauma-informed approach. Interviewers will also be thoroughly trained in research ethics and how to protect participant privacy and confidentiality. And the interviewers will also have the opportunity to practice administering the survey on the tablets that they'll be given for this project. Overall in this training, we aim to equip interviewers with skills that they will not only need for this job, but that they can use and build off of in any future health or outreach positions that they may move on to after this position. And to give an idea of where we are in this process, we are aiming to have hiring complete and to start the training in late August or early September. We are also currently procuring tablets for the interviewers to use, and we're also hiring a research manager who will serve as the interviewer's direct supervisor. Activities that we have completed are design of the survey tool, and we also have a Spanish translation. We have adapted our implementation protocols for remote survey administration, and we have received IRB approval for the survey tool and the modified survey administration plans. And before we close, we would like to mention some final thoughts that we hope will be useful to anyone else planning a survey like this one. First, with the collaborative work group that led this effort, we had some exciting ideas for the survey tool and for survey implementation that we weren't able to include this year if we were going to maintain our timeline for a survey launch. So we've been recording these ideas in a central location, which we call the parking lot, for use in future survey planning. For example, in the future, we'd like to translate the survey into additional languages beyond Spanish, such as French. And in the future, um, if we continue to do some remote survey administration, we would like to partner with a food delivery service so that we can provide participants with food as they complete the survey, just like we would have done if survey administration was being done in person. And we'd also like to mention that when COVID-19 changed the way that we work and that we met as a group, Having strong partnerships in place and having open communication channels was key for being able to successfully adapt our implementation protocols for the survey and move forward with the project. In the future, we'll likely start certain activities earlier, such as the hiring and procurement processes, 
so that when unanticipated obstacles or challenges ar arise, such as the current pandemic, we have more time to come together as a group, discuss different possibilities and any unintended consequences of our decisions, and reach consensus with an adequate amount of time to ensure that our activities adhere with the core principles and the philosophies that we covered earlier in this presentation, including collective ownership, equity, and active participation. And that concludes our presentation on this needs assessment survey. So thank you for taking the time to listen to our presentation. We will now move on to the Q&A session and we look forward to hearing any questions, comments, thoughts about shared experiences that you might have had, any questions or input that you would like to share. Thank you.